Hello, my name is Michelle and I am an LPN at the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic. We are happy you have taken the time to watch this video as it has a lot of valuable information regarding your upcoming surgery. We want to give you a visual on what a knee and a hip replacement look like from a photograph perspective. This picture shows a knee before and after surgery. The before picture shows a knee that has severe OA. The bone is damaged and diseased. The surgeon will remove the diseased and damaged bone and replace it with a titanium and plastic component. Very similar. The damaged bone is removed and replaced with titanium and plastic components. As you are waiting for your surgery date, please try and stay as active as possible. I know that this, this can be difficult, but the stronger you can be going into your surgery, the easier your recovery will be. Hopefully you have received our surgery booklet to prepare better for what is to expect, be expected. In the book, there are exercises that we want you to start doing before the surgery. They will also be the exercises that you will do after your surgery. If you do not have a booklet, please contact our clinic and we will be able to email you a PDF version. We would also recommend you arrange to have a buddy present in your surgery process. Someone in your circle that can help you during your recovery. Ideally, this person would stay in your home and help you with meals, dressing changes, and encouragement. We understand that finding a support person can be difficult for some. We are fortunate enough to have a community support resources available if needed. Some of these resources include Meals on Wheels, which can deliver cooking to your home, Home Care, which is a service that is able to provide some support for you after your surgery with items such as dressing changes, showering, and activities of daily living. They will not help you with household chores, laundry, or transportation. Accessoride can be set up if you do not have a support person to transport you to your appointments. There is a time period of six weeks where you will not be able to transport yourself. If you are interested in any of these resources, please let our clinic know and we will be more than happy to arrange them for you. Hi, my name is Cora. I'm one of the clinic RNs here at the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic. My role is to conduct your pre-op assessment appointment before your surgery by either myself or one of the other healthcare members on our team. You may have already been contacted by one of our administrative staff to schedule your pre-op assessment appointment with information given for your additional testing if required. Upon arrival, you'll be asked by one of our administrative staff to update all your contact information to ensure that our records are current and accurate. In preparation for your pre-op appointment, please bring your Alberta healthcare card all of your medications in their original packaging or bottles and that includes all vitamins, minerals, supplements, ointments, inhalers, analgesics, even CBD or THC, any medications taken regularly or as needed either prescribed or over the counter. This step is imperative to ensure that our healthcare team records accurate dosages in your hospital chart. You'll be given specific instructions regarding your medications leading up to surgery and morning of surgery by your healthcare team. It's also imperative that you follow all these instructions for your own health and safety. Please leave all your medications at home during your surgery unless otherwise indicated by your healthcare team. We encourage you to bring your designated support person to your pre-op assessment appointment. This allows them to be well informed about your upcoming surgery and the expectations for recovery. Knowing your relevant health history is also very important. It will facilitate health history data collection during your pre-op assessment appointment. We encourage writing down any relevant medication or sorry, medical information, including past surgeries in preparation for your appointment. So our healthcare team can accurately build your hospital chart. During your pre-op appointment, a registered nurse will gather all relevant health information, including a current height and or weight and vital signs. Please ensure wearing a loose fitting top or t-shirt to allow for an accurate blood pressure reading. A requisition to the Red Cross will also be submitted during your pre-op appointment for loaning of post-operative equipment. The Red Cross will loan out your equipment for a period of three months with a donation to the Red Cross. If unable to obtain your equipment with the Red Cross, as equipment shortage is at times an issue, it is then your responsibility to gather your required equipment elsewhere. 
Other options would include purchasing brand new through one of our retailers or a retailer of your choice, or secondhand through friends or family members or thrift stores. You must bring your two-wheeled walker and or crutches to the hospital day of surgery as you'll be using it after your surgery. In pre-op, specific instructions will be given to you regarding any specific blood work, diagnostic testing, and or consults ordered by your surgeon to ensure health optimization to your, for your surgery. If you have sleep apnea and you use a CPAP or BiPAP machine, please bring either with you to the hospital morning of surgery upon registration. Your machine will be sent to Biomed at the Chinook Regional Hospital to ensure it is working properly before being utilized either during your surgery and in the recovery room. Therefore, please label your machine accordingly. Before you come for surgery, you will be given your surgery date by your surgeon's office directly, but they will not be giving you a time of your surgery. You will need to contact the hospital two business days before your surgery date. This phone number will be given to you during your pre-op appointment. We do ask that you keep in contact with your pre-op nurse while waiting for surgery. This would include a phone call to us for any breakdown in the skin, abrasions or cuts on your surgical leg. This could potentially have an effect on your surgical date. Another reason to contact your pre-op nurse would be if you were started on any antibiotics prior to your surgery or have any medication changes after your appointment. Please avoid having any major dental work at least two weeks before your surgical date. Many of you have been waiting a long time for the surgery, but unforeseen circumstances do come up. If you need to cancel or change your surgery date, please contact your surgeon's office ASAP. Diet instructions before surgery. It is imperative that you follow these diet instructions before your surgery, as if you had too much liquid or too much food in your stomach morning of surgery and you throw up during your surgery, that could end up in your lungs, which is obviously not a good thing. Eat your regular diet until eight hours before your surgery. You can continue drinking clear fluids, but you must be stopping those clear fluids three hours before your surgery. A clear fluid does not include anything with milk, cream, or juices with pulp. Skin preparation. Do not use any lotions on your surgical leg beginning five days before your surgery. This will reduce the risk of any post-op surgical infections. Remove all makeup. You may wear nail polish or gel nails on your hands or toes. Those are acceptable, but do not wear any makeup. Do not shave or wax your surgical leg for two weeks before surgery. Shaving or waxing will increase the risk of skin breakdown or ingrown hairs, which could potentially delay your surgery. Your skin will be prepared day of surgery at your surgeon's discretion. In your pre-op appointment, you will be given a package much like this. In this package, you will find all the instructions. Now please note these instructions may change at any point, but please follow them. Inside, you will find three chlorhexidine gluconate scrub brushes that you need to start using three days leading up to your surgery. You'll also find a prescription for a mupressin ointment that you will need to apply in your nostrils twice a day with a Q-tip five days leading up to surgery. This package is a pilot project that they are implementing to help reduce the risk of surgical site infections after your surgery. So please do your best at clean, cleansing your skin before surgery. If you miss a day or miss a step, that is all right. Your surgery will still go on, but please try your best at completing this package. If you have any questions about this preparation, you can contact us and any one of our healthcare team members will be able to help you. You should be prepared to stay in hospital for approximately one to two days. This does not include the day of your surgery. That is considered day zero. Please bring whatever personal items you need during this day. The hospital does not supply any personal care products. You will be unable to drive yourself home after your surgery, so please have a support person available to pick you up from the hospital the time of discharge. This could potentially happen any time throughout the day. Day of surgery. When you arrive at the hospital on the day of your surgery, you will need to check in at the information desk in the main atrium. This is going to require your Alberta healthcare card and identification. You may be asked to arrive at the hospital three to four hours prior to your surgery time. Once you are registered, you will go to the unit 3L. This is the pre-op department. If you are unsure of how to get to this unit, please be sure to ask while registering. 
When on the unit 3L, the nurses will prepare you for surgery. They will give you any medications you will need and set you up with an AE hose and a bear hugger warming gown. There are two different types of anesthetic that you will need to be aware of. Some of you will have an appointment with your anesthesiologist before your surgery, but some of you will meet your anesthesiologist until the morning of your surgery. Either way, being informed about your options is important. The spinal anesthetic is a catheter that is put into your spine to allow the surgeon to operate without your feeling your lower extremities. This method is most commonly used and is a lot easier to recover from. Most patients state they are less nauseous after the spinal and are up walking a lot sooner. You are not fully asleep, but they do give you a sedative. The general anesthetic, you will be completely asleep and have no memory of the surgery. This method requires you to be intubated and has effects on your entire body. The spinal is the most commonly used in hip and knee replacement surgeries. Although there are some cases that a general anesthetic would be needed, this includes an anterior approach hip surgery. If you have any further questions about the anesthesia, please don't hesitate to ask your pre-op nurse in your appointment. After your surgery, you will spend some time in the recovery unit, and unit until the nurses feel as though you are stable enough to be transferred to your room. You will not be allowed any visitors in the recovery room. Once you get to your room on 4A, your nurse will do a full head to toe assessment to make sure you are stable. At this point, you will most likely still have oxygen in your nose and an IV giving fluids and medication. If visitors are permitted, they are asked to wait until the nurse has done her initial assessment before entering the room. You are not given much time to rest before one of the nurses is in your room getting you up and moving. The quicker you are up and moving, the better this is for your recovery. You won't be feeling great after your surgery, but it is important to get out of bed and walk the day of your surgery. A lot of patients ask how much weight they are allowed to put on their surgical leg following surgery, and the answer to this question depends on the person. We want you to weight bear as tolerated. Listen to your body. A new, your new hardware is very secure and will not display, be displaced by your body weight. It is designed to hold the weight of your body. Pain management is very important after a joint replacement surgery. If your pain is poorly controlled, you will be unable to complete the recommended exercises or mobilize as much as your surgeon is suggesting. If you are unable to do these things, you are putting yourself at a greater risk for blood clots and your recovery, recovery will be a long, hard road. You are given pain medication when you are discharged from the hospital and we suggest you take them as prescribed. If you allow your pain to creep up to an 8 or a 9 out of 10 on the pain scale, it can be very difficult to bring it back down where you are comfortable. We know some people hesitate to take pain medication, but this surgery is quite invasive and you will need help in managing the pain. When you get discharged from the hospital, you will be given a prescription. This is tr typically Tramacet, Percocet or Tylenol 3. This will depend on your surgeon, but they will also take into account your past history. If you are in need of a prescription refill for your pain medication, we do recommend you contact your family doctor. When you get back to your room, you will be on an IV that is administering your pain medication. As you recover, you are able to eat and drink. The nurses will remove your IV and start giving you your medication by mouth. This medication is available to you every four to six hours. If you are starting to feel your pain creep up, please make sure you are ringing your bell and asking for your pain medication. Once you get home, you will, be able, you will need to be able to manage your medications on your own. This will require you to be aware of when you can take them and remembering your last time you took your medication. If you are not used to taking scheduled medications, you may want to start a medication journal to make sure you're taking your pills responsibly. After surgery, you are at a higher risk of developing a blood clot. We want to give you the knowledge on how to detect the signs and symptoms of a blood clot. We also want to give you the tools to decrease your risk for developing one. Your surgeon will start you on a blood thinner post-surgery. Every individual will be on a blood thinner for different amounts of time. Most people will be started on the blood thinner called Xeralto. It is a tablet you take by mouth usually for around 11 to 21 days. While you are on this blood thinner, you need to be aware that it is not recommended you take any NSAIDs. Anti-inflammatories also have a blood th thinning component to them, thus taking them with your blood thinner produces blood that is too thin. If you have any questions on the medications you can and cannot take, 
please don't, do not hesitate to contact your case manager. The signs of a blood clot that you need to be aware of are redness, heat, and pain. These symptoms will specifically occur in the back of your leg in the calf. If your calf becomes fire engine red, is hot to the touch, and you have intense sharp pain, this could be cause for concern and you should head to the emergency department. In order to, to decrease your chances of developing a blood clot, it is very important that you stay mobile. The more you move and exercise, the chance of you developing a blood clot decreased drastically. While on blood thinners, you are going to be more prone to bruising. Since you're going to be more prone to bruising on your blood thinners, I want to prepare you for what your surgical leg may look like following your surgery. Many people are very taken aback by the bruising and we receive many calls in regards to the degree of bruising after surgery. This slide shows you some pictures of patients that all have varying degrees of bruising, all in which we would consider normal. If you are concerned about your bruising, please don't hesitate to contact your, your case manager. Along with bruising, you will also experience swelling. This swelling can be severe and it can present from your upper thigh down to your toes. The swelling after surgery can really reduce your range of motion and make it very difficult to do the exercises we are providing you. Please know that swelling is normal and there is nothing we can do to prevent it. There are things we can do to help limit the swelling and make you more comfortable. Along with more movement and exercise, you'll, you will have more swelling and this is normal. Some strategies to reduce the swelling and hopefully help with range of motion are rest, ice, and elevation. We suggest that you elevate your surgical leg three times a day for 45 minutes. When you elevate, we ask that you make sure your foot is higher than your heart. This will require you to lay flat with a full length pillow supporting your hip down to your foot as shown in the picture. Please do not bunch up a pillow and put it behind your knee as this restricts the blood flow to your foot. Elevating your foot uses gravity to bring the excess fluid to your heart and allows it to be reabsorbed into your body. The cryocuff is a machine that produces cold therapy to your joint for 24 hours. You, feel, you fill the cooler with ice and attach the cuff to your hip or knee and it gives you just the right amount of cold therapy to your joint. This machine is very convenient, but it is not required. It is only a recommendation. There is a cost associated with the cryocuff. Please see your booklet for a list of all locations that sell or rent the cryocuff. There are three main contributors to constipation following your surgery. Number one, you're not moving as much as you typically would right after your surgery. Number two, most people don't have much, time, much of an appetite right after surgery and the foods you are able to tolerate aren't super high in fiber. Number three, all painkillers have a common side effect of constipation. So if you are taking something for pain every four hours for two weeks or possibly longer, this is eventually going to cause some issues with your digestive system. Some things you can do to stay on top of this issue is making sure you're getting as much fiber into your diet as possible and drinking water to make sure you are staying hydrated. You also need to be as mobile as you can. Go for short walks often. I would recommend having a stool softener or a laxative at home to take proactively so hopefully you can help avoid this issue altogether. Sometimes you can feel nauseated after surgery. If this is the case, please don't hesitate to take a gravol or any antiemetic. Also, just be aware that taking your pain medication on an empty stomach can lead to nausea and upset stomach, so please make sure that you're eating something before you take those pain medications. Most patients come home with what we call a post-op visible dressing on their incision. This is a dressing that is put on right after your surgery and should stay on for seven days. There are some circumstances that would require your original dressing to be removed early. For instance, if your incision is draining and covers more than 50% of the area of your dressing, it should be removed. Also, if it is leaking or peeling off, you may have to remove it early. If this is the case, you will put on a sterile gauze, which will require you to have dressing changes every 24 hours. If you have sterile gauze on your incision, please be aware that this cannot get wet. If you do not feel comfortable doing dressing changes on your incision, please contact us and we will be more than happy to set up home care for you. The post-op visible dressing is water resistant, which allows you to shower with the dressing on without worry. Once you are seven days post-op, you will remove this dressing. It comes off just like a bandage would. 
If you are able to get in and out of your shower, I would recommend taking off your dressing in the shower. This way, it allows the water to run over the incision and give it a good clean. Please don't use any soaps, creams, or lotions on your incision, but it is okay for the water to run over your incision. After you remove the dressing on day seven, you are free to leave your incision open to the air. It does not need to be covered by a dressing. All incisions are different and all people heal at different rates. If you are concerned about how your incision is healing, please don't hesitate to email your case manager a picture or contact us to ask any questions. Some of the surgeons here in Lethbridge use staples and some of them use dissolvable sutures. Regardless of what your surgeon uses, we like to see everyone at two weeks post-op so that we can take a look at your incision and make sure that you are healing appropriately. Let's talk about some things to keep in mind when you are handling your incision. You always want to make sure you wash your hands before you touch or handle your incision. Showers are great for your incision even once you take off your post-op dressing. You can let the water run over the incision to give it a good clean. Please don't submerge your incision in any water for six weeks. That means no bathtubs, no hot tubs until you follow up with your surgeon at the six week mark. If at any time you are concerned with how your incision is healing, please don't hesitate to call our clinic and get in contact with your case manager. If you take your dressing off and you notice your incision is still draining, please contact one of us here at the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic so we can make sure that everything is looking the way it should and we don't need to get in contact with your surgeon. Please keep an eye on your incision and note anything that may be a sign of infection. Some things we would like you to be aware of are any new onset of pain or tenderness. If you move the wrong way or have a fall and then all of a sudden you have new pain that develops, this would be a cause for concern and you should contact your case manager. If you have redness along your incision and it starts to move outward or your incision is hot to touch, that would be a good indication that maybe something isn't healing correctly. Your incision may be warm during the healing process, especially if you are comparing it to your non-surgical leg. Infection radiates a substantial amount of heat, not just a little warmth. Also, like I mentioned before, if you have, a, have drainage it, and it is yellow in color or bloody, that could indicate infection. Also, just a general feeling of unwell and a fever that lasts for more than 24 hours. We are going to put up some pictures of incisions that are showing signs of infection. You can notice that all three of these incisions are quite red. The one in the middle you notice isn't healing together very nicely and this patient had a lot of drainage in those areas. But, we, like, but like we said before, if you just aren't sure about something, we are here to answer those questions for you, so please don't hesitate to call us. Please call 911 or go to your nearest ER department if you develop any chest pain or heart palpitations, if you have shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, if you have any sharp tenderness in your calves marked with redness, warmth, and you believe you could be developing a blood clot, or any concerns with your incision if it is after hours or on the weekend. Hello, my name is Brittany. I am one of the LPNs that work here at the clinic. So the next part of the video, we're gonna be talking about physio and the different types of equipment you're gonna need after surgery. So for anyone who's having a total knee replacement, you guys do have some do's and don'ts we want you to avoid after surgery. So for our knee replacement patients, the biggest thing is we want you to avoid is squatting or kneeling on that incision or on that knee for the first six weeks. I won't lie to you guys, after surgery, Lots of people report having that prosthetic in their knee that it kind of feels weird to kneel on your knee. So if you're someone that loves to garden, you know, doing housework, whatever, um, a big thing that can help with squatting or kneeling on your knee after surgery is if you're kneeling, um, use a really thick cushion underneath there can make it feel a lot better. And then for our hip replacement patients, you guys have what I call are the three golden rules. So the first rule is we do not want you to cross your legs at all. So not at your ankles, at your knees, no crossing your legs at all for three months following surgery. We also want you to avoid putting all of your weight onto your surgical leg and then twisting on it. And then the third golden rule is no flexing at your waist past 90 degrees. So just how that bottom picture shows, if you're sitting, we want you just at that perfect 90 degree angle. So unfortunately, no picking anything up off the ground, stuff like that. 
And again, these rules are for three months following surgery. For everybody, whether you're having a knee or a hip replacement, we do have recommendations um, that we do have in place. And the reason we have these recommendations is to help prolong the life of your new joint. So after surgery, and these recommendations, they are for life, um, is no high impact activities. So no jumping, running, or jogging. No repetitive lifting of over 25 pounds. No contact sports. And again, no putting all of your weight on your surgical leg and twisting. Now, after saying all that, of course, please note walking is fine, hiking is fine, swimming is fine, ellipticals are fine, just no heavy impact activities. So what we're going to talk about next are exercises to help strengthen your knee after a total knee replacement. So these are exercises that are all in your book, so please don't hesitate to also look in your book um, after surgery, um, but we're going to show you how to do them in person right now. Exercise one is called armchair push-ups. What we want you to do is sit on a steady chair with your feet flat on the floor, push up with both arms to lift yourself a few inches off the seat, hold for a count of three to five seconds, slowly lower yourself onto the chair and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise two is, are called ankle pumps. This, was, this may be done sitting on a steady chair or laying down. Bend your ankles to move feet up and down, alternating feet. Repeat at least 10 times for both feet. This is a great exercise for circulation and a really easy one to do right after surgery. Exercise three is for core stability. So you can do this when lying or sitting with your back supported. Bend both knees and keep your feet flat. Tighten your lower stomach muscles by pulling your belly button down towards your spine. Squeeze the pelvic muscles that stop the flow of pee. Breathe normally while holding that for a count of three to five. Relax and then repeat. Exercise four, simple thigh squeezes. What we want you to do is lay down on a bed or on the floor. Keep the kneecap and toes of the leg you are working facing the ceiling. Pull your toes up towards your head. Tighten the muscles in the front of your thigh and push the back of your knee into the bed. Hold for three to five seconds. Relax and then repeat five to 10 times. Exercise five, harder thigh squeezes. For this one, what we want you to do is lay down on the bed or on the floor. Place a firm roll under your knee. Straighten your leg, lifting your foot off the bed. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your leg and repeat five to ten times. Exercise six, thigh lifts. What we want you to do is lie down on a, on a bed or on the floor. With one knee in a comfortable position, tighten your thigh muscles and lift your other leg, keeping the knee straight. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your leg to the bed and then repeat five to 10 times. Please note, do not do this exercise only when you can complete exercise number four. Exercise seven, knee straightening. Lie down on a bed or on the floor. Keep the kneecap and toes facing the ceiling. Place a small roll under one ankle and push the knee down towards the bed. Hold for a count of 30 seconds. Relax and then repeat. Exercise eight knee bend. Bend your knee by sliding your heel along the bed towards your buttocks or backside. Make sure your knees face the ceiling at all times. Slide it up and then hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly straighten your knee by sliding your heel back to your starting position and then repeat five to ten times. Sitting knee bends. 
Sit on a steady chair with your feet flat on the floor. Slowly slide your foot back as far as you can go. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly slide your foot back to the starting position. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 10, sitting knee straightening. Sit on a steady chair with your thigh supported. Lift your foot and straighten your knee. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot to the floor and repeat five to 10 times. The last three exercises we are gonna do standing. Make sure you stand straight, tuck in your stomach and tighten your buttocks for all of them. Exercise 11, standing knee bends. Hold on to a table or counter for support. Slowly bend your knee by lifting your heel towards your buttocks. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot to the floor. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 12, standing knee lift. Hold onto the table or counter for support. Lift your knee as if you were going up a step. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot to the floor. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 13, mini knee bends. Hold onto a table or counter for support. Stand with your legs shoulder width apart and your toes pointed forward. Keep your weight in your heels. Slowly bend your knees, keeping your heels on the floor and your knees apart. Don't bend the tips of your knees past your toes at the bottom of the bend. Hold for a count of three to five seconds, slowly returning to your starting position. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercises to build your strength after a total hip replacement. These exercises are in your what, when you're having a hip replacement booklet, and I will do them in the same order as they are listed. Exercise one makes back thigh muscles stronger and your hip more flexible. Start by lying down on your bed. Bend your knee by sliding your heel along the bed towards your buttocks or backside. Make sure your knee faces the ceiling at all times. Hold for a count of three to five seconds and then slowly straighten your knee by sliding your heel back to your starting position. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercise two. This exercise makes your legs stronger and your hips more flexible. Start laying down, slide one leg out to the side, keep your knee straight and toes pointed to the ceiling while sliding your leg. Don't go any further than shown in the picture. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slide your leg back so that, the so that it's in line with your belly button and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise three makes your front thigh muscle stronger. So start laying down, place a firm roll under your knee, straighten your leg, lifting your foot off the bed. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise four um, is used to make your stomach muscles stronger. Start laying on your back, bend both knees and keep your feet flat. Tighten your lower stomach muscles by pulling your belly button down towards your spine. Breathe normally while holding for a count of three to five seconds. Relax and repeat five times. Exercise five is used to make your front thigh muscles stronger. Sit on a steady chair with your thigh supported. Lift your foot and straighten your knee. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot to the floor and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise six makes back thigh muscle stronger and your leg more flexible. Start sitting on a steady chair with your feet flat on the floor. Slowly slide your foot back as far as you can Hold for a count of three to five seconds and then slowly slide your foot back to the starting position. Repeat five to 10 times. Exercise seven makes your upper arms and shoulders stronger. Sit on a steady chair with your feet flat on the floor. 
Push up with both arms to lift yourself a few inches off the seat. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower yourself onto the chair and repeat five to 10 times. When doing the next five exercises, we want you standing straight, tuck in your stomach, and tighten your buttocks. Exercise eight makes your legs stronger and your hips more flexible. Start standing and hold on to a table or counter for support. Slowly move your leg out to the side and then back in. Keep your legs straight at all times and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise nine makes your legs stronger and your hips more flexible. Start standing, holding onto a table or counter for support. Keep your back and legs straight. Slowly move one leg behind you. Keep the legs straight. Be careful not to lean forward and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 10 is a standing knee lift. So we want you to hold onto a table or counter for support. Lift your knee as if you were going up a step. Hold for a count of three to five seconds and then slowly lower your foot to the floor and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 11 makes your back thigh muscles stronger. Hold onto the table or counter for support. Keeping your back and legs straight, bend one knee up by lifting your heel towards your buttocks. Be careful not to move your thigh forward. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly lower your foot to the floor and repeat five to 10 times. Exercise 12 makes your front thigh and buttocks muscles stronger. Hold onto a table or counter for support. Stand with your legs shoulder width apart and your toes pointed forward. Keeping your weight in your heels, slowly bend your knees, keeping your heels on the floor and your knees apart. Make sure not to bend forward at the waist. Make sure your knees don't bend past the tips of your toes. Hold for a count of three to five seconds. Slowly return to your starting position and repeat five to 10 times. These are just some frequently asked questions we get from our hip patients following surgery. So one that we always get is of course, when should I start my exercises after surgery? So these exercises should be started in the hospital with assistance from a physiotherapist and continued what immediately once you're home from the hospital. However, it does not hurt to start them now. So of course you are more familiar with them and then of course being a bit stronger will help as well. Number two, how often should I be doing my exercises? So we want you to be doing these exercises two to three times a day 10 to 15 repetitions per exercises. Keeping in mind when first home from the hospital, this may be too much for you. In that case, please start off with you know, less repetitions, doing them less often, and then as you get stronger, your pain decreases, then increase the amount. Number three, my leg is swollen and painful. There's no point in doing my exercises if I can't get the bend I want. Now, swelling is something that is very normal and common after surgery and is no excuse to stop doing your exercises. You need to be getting active range of motion into your new surgical joint as soon as possible to help prevent scar tissue buildup and prevent complications later on. Walking does not count as active range of motion into your joint. Number four, will I get to see a physiotherapist after I am discharged home? So, what will happen is when you are discharged from the hospital, you will not be given a follow-up with a physiotherapist. What will happen is you will see the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic at the two-week mark, your surgeon at the six-week mark. So of course, please don't hesitate to call, ask us questions, but at that two-week mark, you can also ask us questions about physio. Um, and then what will happen is when you see your surgeon at the six-week mark, if they feel you need to see a physiotherapist, that's when they will pass you on, okay? Equipment needs. So there are quite a few pieces of equipment that we suggest everyone gets following their operation. Of course, there's tons of options here in town that you can rent or purchase equipment from. We generally send everyone we see to Red Cross. Red Cross is an amazing option because they are a volunteer based program um, and it's all based on your discretion. So what you can do is you can go rent equipment from them and then you can donate as little or as much as you feel appropriate for them. 
Um, so Red Cross is an awesome option, but we also have places you can purchase and rent from. So when you do come for your pre-op appointment, just know they'll be going over those options with you and we'll be giving you a bit more information about all those different options of where you can get your equipment. Sitting down. So this can be used for sitting on a chair, toilet seat, or in a vehicle. In a perfect world, every chair that we would sit on following surgery would have armrests. Of course, we know that's not totally allowed, um, but in a perfect world, if you have a chair that, a really comfortable chair that has armrests, um, we do recommend getting one for after surgery. So when you go to sit down, the first thing we want to do is we want to back up until you can feel that chair against your legs, of course, just so that you know it's there, you're not sitting on nothing. We want you to reach back for the chair with your arms and then slowly lower yourself down. Please note, we do not want you using your walking aids to help lower yourself or pick yourself up because of course they can slip away from you. And then when you go to get up from the chair, it's just the opposite. You're gonna push with your arms up, stand nice and straight, and then grab onto your walking aid and continue on. So getting in and out of bed. Just like with the chair, you wanna back up onto your bed until you can feel it on the back of your legs. Reach back for the bed and sit down. The biggest trick with getting in and out of bed is once you're sitting, try to position your buttocks towards your pillows. Slowly with your arms, maneuver yourself back into the bed. What that will cause is your legs to gradually or naturally follow you into bed as well, making it easier for your legs to get into bed. So just like the diagram shows here, um, really easy they make it look easy to do um, but right after surgery one of the hardest things to do is lift your surgical leg into bed one of the hardest things after surgery is lifting your surgical leg into bed so some tricks of the trade are one is taking your non-surgical leg hooking it underneath your surgical leg and then using it almost as a lever to help pull that leg into bed Another trick you can use to get your surgical leg into bed is to take a cane walker or even your sheets, a belt, anything you can kind of lasso around your surgical leg, pull tight, and then you're able to have a little bit more, bit more control of getting that leg into bed. The next piece of equipment we're going to talk about is called the tub transfer bench. So this transfer bench is for anybody who has a tub shower. Now, once you're further along in surgery and you are able to totally tolerate full weight bearing on your operated leg, you won't need this. You will be able to step into your tub. But just for those first few weeks, it's just used to get you into your shower safely. So if you can kind of imagine with us, this bench would be half in your shower, half out of your shower. So just like Michelle is showing, she's going to sit on the edge. She's going to slowly bring her legs in one at a time into her tub. <laughs> and then slowly shift her weight to the side. Once she's safely in her tub, she can sit and shower just as she is, or she can then stand and shower. It's just whatever you are more comfortable with. The most important piece of equipment following your surgery that you are going to need is a two-wheeled walker. The reason we prefer a two-wheeled walker versus a four-wheeled walker is, of course, there's less wheels on it, so less likely to get away from you. And another big reason we prefer the two-wheeled walker is most two-wheeled walkers don't have a bench in them. So that way, just as Michelle is showing you, she can stand inside of the walker. So if something were to happen, you know, maybe she gets a leg cramp, her pain shoots out of control, you're able to catch yourself better than you would with a four-wheeled walker that would kind of make you kind of stand at a weird 45 degree angle outside of it. So when we use your two-wheeled walker at first, we just want you to pick that walker up, slowly move it forward, and then always lead with your surgical leg, follow through with your non-surgical, and just like this, it's just gonna be a slow pace at first. Doing stairs. So following surgery, you are more than able to do stairs. We do want you to do them safely though. So when you're doing stairs, make sure you are using either a cane and a railing um, or two crutches. Make sure you're definitely not using your walker on stairs. Um, and then when it comes to footwork, we like to use the term, the good goes to heaven and the bad goes down, just to remember which foot to lead with. So when you're doing stairs, you're going to have a railing on one side, your cane on the other. Doesn't matter what side you had surgery on, we just want something on either side of you. 
So on the way up, we use the term the good goes to heaven. So that means you're going to always lead with your non-surgical leg. So you're going to lead with your non-surgical leg, followed by your operated leg, and then the cane comes last. On the way down, we do it opposite. It's the good goes up and the bad goes down. So on the way down, you're going to lead with your surgical leg or your operated leg first, and then your non-operated leg. You're good to go. And again, just like when going up, just one at a time. So anybody who has a walk-in shower, of course, you're not going to need that big transfer bench. We do still recommend getting a bath seat though. So just in case if you're in the shower, you develop a leg cramp, all of a sudden your pain shoots out of control. Um, it's just an awesome safety option to have so that you can sit, take a break, um, you know, finish your shower or, you know, at least be able to rinse off instead of kind of scrambling out all soapy. Uh, please note if you're someone who does love, you know, baths, you know, soaking in the tub, make sure that you are comfortable moving from sitting on the floor to a standing position before attempting sitting in the bottom of your tub. Um, and do keep in mind, no totally submerging your incision for the first six weeks. So another thing we need to talk about when it comes to bathroom safety is your toilet. Now, you don't have to get a raised toilet seat, but I won't lie, they will make your life a whole lot easier. There's tons of different options when it comes to the raised toilet seat that you can get. The one we have in this picture is just a four inch raised toilet seat. That'll just, of course, make it easier to get on and off. There's other options though. You can get a five inch raised toilet seat with arms attached, or if you're lucky enough to already have a taller toilet, another option we can get you is what's called the toilet safety frame. So that's just those little armrests going around that toilet. And it's just, of course, again, just helpful to have something to push on. And of course, to when you are lowering yourself down as well, just to have those armrests there. All right, so just some more bathing, showery safety tips. So of course, we already talked about the adjustable height tub transfer bench and the bath seat. But another really great option is called the clamp on tub grab bar. So if you can kind of imagine, this would just go on the side of your tub. You can tighten it nice and tight and then it just gives you an extra handle to help get you in and out of the tub safely, especially once you're feeling more confident and can fully weight bear on your surgical leg, just a great option to have. Some other things you can purchase or install, um, of course, aren't able to rent, um, unfortunately, um, are of course wall bars, um, a telephone shower, so just like a detachable head can make life easier. Of course, a non-slip bath mat, and then a long handled sponge. So again, can't rent this, do have to purchase it, but of course, just makes reach, getting to those hard to reach places a little easier. All right, and then dressing aids. So you may find that using adaptive equipment may be very helpful for dressing and undressing, especially the lower part of your body, especially when you're not able to bend that full 90 degrees, talking to our hip patients here, but for our hips and our knees patients. So of course, something that can make life just way easier is a long handled reacher. You know, if you drop something, it makes it easier to pick up. And in the hospital, they'll actually show you how useful these can be to get your pants on and off, socks, different things like that. Now we unfortunately don't have a sock aid for putting on socks, but in the picture it does show one. And again, let us know if that's something you're interested in and then we can go over a little more in detail in your pre-op appointment if that is something you would like. Another thing that can make life easier, of course, a long handled or long handled shoehorn for just of course putting those shoes on and off. Don't be surprised though, you might get swelling all the way into your toes. So it doesn't ever hurt to have some loose fitting shoes for right after surgery as well. Um, another other thing that can be really helpful, of course, is also elastic shoelaces. So instead of having to reach down and tie those shoes, you can just kind of pull them nice and tight and you're good to go. So getting it in and out of the vehicle for lots of people can be really tough after surgery. So before you get into any vehicle, or if you know who's picking you up after surgery, I just always say practice. <laughs> if you know what car is coming to get you, practice, pretend you can't bend that leg and it's more sore than it is now, um, and just pretend getting in and out of the vehicle, practice, practice, practice. Um, of course, the very first thing you do before you get into someone's vehicle is take that seat, move it as far back as you possibly can, even recline it a little bit, just to of course give yourself as much room as possible. 
Another trick of the trade that we use for getting in and out of the vehicles is if you can take a plastic bag, like a Safeway bag, garbage bag, put it on that seat so then when you go to maneuver yourself in and out of the vehicle, just causes less friction on your bum and lots of people find that one really helpful too. And then parking. If you're getting into a very low vehicle, try to make sure they park away from the curb so that way you're not stepping off a six inch, you know, curb height into your vehicle. You're already kind of at that level um, and that'll make life a lot easier. And then for trucks, kind of the opposite. If you're in a big truck, big SUV, try to park as close to the curb as you possibly can. So then you just naturally have that six inch lift. So one of the biggest questions we always get is when can I get rid of my walker and switch to my cane? So that's gonna be a little bit different for each person, but once you're feeling steady on your feet and you wanna give the cane a try, I always recommend it. So the biggest thing with the cane is please, please, please remember the cane needs to be in the opposite side you have your surgery on. So if you have your right knee or right hip replaced, we want that cane in your left hand. If you have your left knee or your left hip replaced, we want it in your right hand. So when you're using the cane, you're gonna move your cane and the operated leg at the same time. What this does is it will displace the pressure going through your leg into the cane and then follow through with your non-operated leg. And just like Michelle is doing, you're just gonna go nice and slow at first. And then once you're feeling more confident, don't hesitate to then follow through with your non-surgical leg. So outpatient physio. So what'll happen is for all of our patients having a total knee replacement, we would like you guys to see a physiotherapist at around the two week mark. So if you do live here in town in Lethbridge, you will be sent home with that appointment already booked. Now, however, if you live in a smaller center, so if you live out in Raymond, Tabor, you know, Standoff, you know, all those places you can do physio in, um, but keep in mind, you'll probably have to call them to book in for that. So all of our knee patients, we do want you seeing a physio at two weeks. Um, now it's a bit different for our hip replacement patients. Now keep in mind for our hip patients, we still want you going home and doing those exercises, but you will not see a physiotherapist. What will happen is you'll see the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic at two weeks, your surgeon at six weeks, and if your surgeon feels you need physio from there, they'll send you on. Falls. So of course, following surgery, falls, they do occur way too frequently. Um, so of course, please make sure you look through your little checklist there about the fall proof checklist and do it as soon as you possibly can. You know, try to take your time, try not to rush. I know easier said than done when you might be having pain, but try to take your time, take caution on stairs, use the railings and a cane or crutches, and please do not use your walker on stairs for obvious reasons. You know, avoid walking over wet or icy surfaces if you are having surgery in the winter and if you do fall. If you do fall and you're having issues not able to weight bear, please contact us. Let us know what's going on at the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic. Driving. So I know lots of patients are very eager to get back into that driver's seat after surgery, but keep in mind um, there's no rush for it. So generally for both, whether you're having a right or a left leg done, um, no driving for at least the first two weeks. If it's your right leg, you absolutely have to be cleared by your surgeon before you can start driving. If it's your left leg, it's a little bit different. Um, there are a few things that of course you need to accomplish. One is you can't be driving a standard because of course then you're using your left leg anyways. Um, you have to be totally off your narcotics, so no pain management, you have to be you know, off of those completely. Um, and when it comes to your left leg, it never hurts to know your own insurance policy because you'll be shocked to find that most insurance policies have something written in there about having a total joint replacement so just make sure you know your own policy before you get behind the driver's wheel. So just some quick reminders, make sure that you have someone that can pick you up at discharge and you can be discharged from the hospital at any time. We wanna make sure again that you're balancing activity with exercise so you're almost using that leg just as much as you're resting it, um, keeping up on your pain management and of course elevating that leg to help with swelling. 
Um, now keep in mind that post-op visible site dressing that we do use, that dressing's coming off post-op day seven, and you will be doing that at home. So please let us know if you have any concerns with your incision. Just know we're here for happy to help. Uh, keep in mind, everyone's going to go home with a blood thinner. Um, each surgeon does prescribe it a little bit differently, so just make sure you're following those instructions and you're finishing out your prescribed amount. Uh, again, you're going to have a two-week follow-up here with us at the Chinook Bone and Joint Clinic. For all of our knee patients, you're going to be having a physio assessment at the two-week mark as well. And then everyone does have a six-week follow-up with their scheduled surgeon. So again, make sure you find a buddy, a support person, someone you trust, someone that can help you through this whole process because it is a lot for you to go through. Prepare your home, do that fall proof checklist, get everything ready to go. The more prepared you are, the better. Um, do your exercises to your best of your ability, keeping in mind the more you can do, the better, the more circulation you can get into that joint to help prevent scar tissue buildup, the better you're gonna do long term. Make sure you have all your equipment ready before you go into the hospital and I actually suggest having it all ready and prepared to go one week before your surgical date. Make sure you bring your walker with you to the hospital. You're going to want that when you get discharged so bring that walker with you um, and don't forget you will be up mobilizing post-op day zero. So same day you have surgery you will be up and moving and walking those 10 steps. You are going to have swelling, you're going to have bruising and you're going to have pain. So instead of just trying to toughen it out, you know, keep in mind you just had a major operation so rest that leg, ice it, elevate it take your painkillers as needed and in time it will get better. Pain management, again, most important thing following surgery, so just don't hesitate to take stuff if you need it. Um, again, if you have any questions following your surgery, before surgery, maybe 